G'day mates, Nate the Aussie here. How you doing? So I have a couple of lovely people here. We have one other person coming. Uh, he's he's running a bit late. He might he may or may not be here. We're not entirely sure. Just have to see how he goes. Um, but here I've got Aiden with me, sort of in the top left. And I've also got uh, Jeremy, who doesn't have a video, unfortunately, but he's sort of down in the middle there. Uh, so what we're going to do, gents, is before we get started, um, I'm just going to ask you to sort of go around. We'll start off with uh, Aiden, and then we'll go to... Um, gem and then i'll finish it off just um introducing yourself um and sort of your background and either living history and or martial arts really just to sort of lay the groundwork so aiden you want to you want to take it away mate uh yeah so i'm aiden i'm the president of a living history group based on 15th century oh you're the president now yeah, I'm president this year. Bugger me. Oh, okay. That's different. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you keep going. Um, I've been doing that for about nine years now. I got a martial art background in Taekwondo, Hema, Hapkido, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, kinetic fighting, which is like Australian Krav Maga, um, mm. Jis and Budo, and a little bit of experience in mixed martial arts, including Muay Thai, Dutch kickboxing, and wrestling. Sweet. Awesome. Cheers, Aiden. All right. What about you, Jim? Give us a, give us a bit of a stick on yourself. Can you hear me when I talk? Just. Just. Okay. I'll talk loud. <laughs> um, yeah, right. So I'm the marshal of a uh, living history group here in Australia. Um, so I, I'm responsible for teaching your members and doing the whole safety stuff. Um, background I suppose I've done a bit of um like karate when I was a kid bit of boxing stuff like that um did some fencing but not a whole lot and then moved on to uh living history stuff sweet so what uh living history period do you do just to give people some context oh yeah sure um so I do 12th century European and uh 16th century Japanese Yes. All right. And just so uh, the viewers know, um, uh, Gem is actually in my uh, 16th century living history group that does Japan uh, that, that I've mentioned on before with videos. And he's also in the same late 12th century medieval group that I'm a part of as well. Um, and I met Aiden back in 2015. Uh, and 14, we were, I think. Oh, was it 24? Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Show so much I remember. Um, <laughs> and we were both squires at that point. And I think I'd been fighting maybe like a, a few months longer than him or something. Like it was pretty, we we're pretty the same. We were pretty newbie at that point. And uh, yeah, so a lot of time has passed. So that's how um, I know the people here. Um, and if other mate was able to come in here from the UK, um, I started chatting to him uh, about four months ago and his background is specifically in Niten Ichi Ryu, which is a new hard that is meant to be um, based on uh, was meant to be uh, Miyamoto Musashi's uh, school that he started uh, so that is his background that he'll be ringing uh, if he's able to make it today but we have a great list of questions here uh, I've only got I think only about three or four of these I made myself. Everything else uh, is people submitting stuff. So if you submitted something, thank you so much. Uh, we've uh, really given us, us uh, an interesting task here. So what we'll start off with is just each of sort of person's opinion on, I suppose, what is living history? Um, Aiden, did you want to sort of answer that one? That's a, it's a complicated one. Mm. Um, <laughs> But I think living history is mostly learning through doing. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at like the hierarchy of learning, there's reading, there's exercises, there's doing things and there's teaching. Uh, living history really allows us to get into the shoes of the people in the past. And there have been many examples where historians have said, well, this is what something is. But the living history people who actually use these things have to say, no, no, that, that's totally wrong. You've got no evidence for that. It's used like this. We know people who have used it and can trace their roots back all the way through Europe and we can get much more better documentation. Mm. Um, I think there's no better way to understand history than to live in the shoes of someone from that period. Like you, you can understand all the socio-political events, but until you've lived over a weekend, a week or however long, you can never understand just how they live. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. Right. Did you have something to add to that, um, Jem? What What is what living history is? Uh yeah. So I kind of view it as um, a two role thing. So mm. if you join a living history group, it's more sort of uh, in depth. You know, you are learning the history through doing it, um, so to speak. Mm. The secondary role is, of course, educating the public, because you know your historian can come out and they can describe what it's like to fight in armor but a uh, living history person has actually fought in armor and can probably give a bit of a better um, mm -hmm. idea of what it's like right um so it yeah i kind of view it as um two part like we have a, a duty to ourselves and a duty to public who interact with us mm. yeah i mean like it's it's interesting um i suppose just before i put in my opinion on this i, I should also mention sorry my own background so again my name's Nathaniel. Uh, at the moment, I'm uh, training in uh, IKMF, uh, International Krav Maga Federation, which is a civilian branch of Krav Maga. Um, I st I studied uh, bits of I studied bits of boxing um, when I was younger, sort of in late primary school, early high school, um, and um, I got into living history sort of in 2014. Uh, and I've sort of been ever since then. I was sort of been interested in um, trying to study uh historical european martial arts that kind of kicked it off for me and i started been doing i've started sort of getting into that um in the past i think 2015 was when i first started getting into that and now i've been getting into it much more uh recently and in terms of uh, i've just started to conduct study of uh different japanese martial arts as well that are period for uh, my living history group as well uh just for historical martial arts research which has been really really interesting sorry i just thought i mentioned that i forgot to mention but back to living history i, I think yeah i do, i think both yeah it's a mix of what aiden and jem has said i reckon it's a mix of trying to connect make a connection to the past that's made through experience and emotion and physical like sensual feelings so like taste smell touch all those kinds of things uh so we have that way of looking into the past rather than just reading about it um there's a great quote actually by a guy called Ian Mortimer. He wrote the Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England. And he said that like the the way we learn about a, a his, history might be through ruins or archives, but the means whereby we, we may understand it uh, is and always will be ourselves. Uh, and I think that's a really good point here. And I think that's a big basis for a lot of what living history does. Um, yeah. So that's that one. Uh, next. Uh, what is historical Japanese martial arts? Is it required in a living history context? Why or why not? Jem, did you want to give oh, your input on this? And before, on this one. and before he does, I should mention everyone, uh, what we are saying is based on our opinion, based on our experience, okay? We're not people who are claiming to be experts in everything. This is purely for discussion purposes. So I thought I should add that disclaimer in there. So Jem, take it away. So whether it's required for living history, context um if you had asked me that uh probably two years ago i would have answered with i don't know but um mm -hmm. as i've been a bit more exposed to the stuff i'm beginning to think more and more that the answer is absolutely we do mm -hmm. need it because um some of what's taught in modern uh japanese martial arts well, I think this is a tendency for all martial arts, really, is you, you get mm. ineffective things that are passed down from teacher to student, and it's not really put to the test. Um, mm. So the research required to prove certain things were done in the past is pretty um, helpful as far as, um, you know, actually finding an effective martial arts that would work mm. in real life mm. um so I, I don't think i can really add much more to it than that that's fine Plus, yeah that's all good because it's mainly just getting our general opinion on things based on our experience and so on um mm. and i reckon i would have had a similar opinion i think when i first started uh in reenactment historical reenactment in general and this doesn't really it's not necessarily just with japanese this one because i started off doing 12th century europe uh but i think when i first started i was the same as you i'd be like it's not 
You don't need to learn mm. those this stuff. I mean, that, that's kind of like you just you just go out there and have fun and hit people with swords. It's it's all good. Um, and I think later though, once you got more experience and you got more appreciation for the history, I think that's when it became actually. Wait, hang on a second. We should try and take this seriously. Um, so I suppose I was I'm similar with you in that regard. I think mm. there there is also the problem. Um, well, not really a problem the fact that with the Japanese stuff, there's kind of like um, an oversaturation of Japanese martial arts, mm. particularly in sort of Western cultures. There's heaps of things like karate, ninjutsu, yeah, Aikido, yeah. all that sort of stuff all gets lumped in together. And um, like, there's lots and lots of schools around for it. Um, and I suppose the historical stuff takes a bit of a different look at it. So I think that's pretty beneficial yeah and so i suppose to answer this question at least from our perspective what is historical japanese martial arts well it's um it is the study of various different martial systems that um were that developed uh throughout japanese history um and i suppose whether or not it's needed for a living history context i i think if you're going to be doing any kind of combat um i think we would say yeah it, it definitely it definitely is and should be required um because otherwise if you're not making any effort to get into the combat systems at all then i don't know then what are you doing really i suppose is the question um i think that'd be safe to say would you reckon jim yeah uh you can't you can't learn fighting from books to be perfectly honest yeah you, you can't to, yeah or you, you, you can't learn it train. purely from books yeah yeah you, yeah, you need to there, train yeah. with someone you need to actually see how the body functions mm. um so now that's right well actually this uh goes to this question goes to aiden i think because it's the exact same question but is what is hema is it required in a living history context why why not take it away um well hema is historical european martial arts um I personally define it as any fighting system pre-industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. Some people push that even more modern. Some people not not that late, but that's where I put it. Um, is it required in living history? I say no. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many different facets of living history that you don't need to know how to fight for. Yeah. Um, but if you're trying to get yourself into the shoes of someone who'd be in a martial position, so a knight, a soldier, even like a cook on campaign, um, I think it's absolutely necessary. You need to know how they trained. You need to know what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. If you're like, if you just want to portray a soldier wearing armor, you don't want to fight. How do you know the arm is right? You, you can't know it unless you tr you've tried it out, you've tested it out, you've fought in it. Mm. Um, speaking from having done lots of armored fighting, you really gain an understanding and appreciation of just how armor works and the subtleties and very specific points that you wouldn't know if you didn't use it. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose that connects again with our answer to what is living history is, is that it, it gives you a chance to actually feel what someone felt and you can't know, every, you, you, you can't understand the, you can know about the armor, but you can't understand it unless you actually put yourself in that context and that's be like, oh, right. this is what it feels like. <laughs> and I think that's the same as what Gem and I are saying with historical Japanese martial arts. Also, old mate has just joined there. I think he's just trying to fix his audio. Um, when you join in, mate, that's okay. Just let us know. Um, uh, right, wait, we can't hear you, man. You lost your train of thought? Or? I've, I think he's trying to say hello. <laughs> it still says connecting to audio. Yeah. yeah. Just give it a few seconds. It'll fix itself. Yeah, hang Zoom's on. a little bit slow when you start up. Yeah, I'll just let him know because I think he, he think I think he thinks we can hear him. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think it's the same with us with Japanese stuff as well because, um, yeah, it, again, it depends on what role you're doing. Like again, if you just purely want to do carpentry, well, then you probably don't really need to know a lot about a martial system. But if you want to portray someone who would be within that martial system in history, you kind of do have to give it the respect it deserves and actually look at the, actually look at the system. Uh, I, um, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, yeah, personally, I think that um, people back then they would have had exposure to fighting in the same way that we have exposure to things like boxing and stuff. Mm -hmm. um 
so like they had tournaments and all sorts of things where people would rock up and just sort of watch it um you have uh records of people just rocking up and taking a look at the battle happening down by the river you know mm. um so i think that at least a basic understanding of fighting and um the body mechanics and what's actually going on is is important if you're trying to portray a medieval person i'll probably counter that in like the sense that modern day people who watch and enjoy boxing or mixed martial arts, most of them don't know crap about any of it like the average person watching an MMA match where it goes to the end, just say, just stand up. Not that easy. Most people who watch and appreciate it don't understand anything about the body mechanics. Mm. And I highly doubt the people who weren't trained, who still enjoyed watching like a joust or a tournament, knew much about it anyway. They just say, hey, you got hit. Obviously, that's bad. Mm. I suppose the difference would be awareness and being actually in the system, I think. Because I think there's definitely a sense of more awareness of what some of the fighting may have been like, but I think that's still different to studying the actual martial system. Um, I feel I think I think the latter is a bit more specific. Um, well, it's it's just yeah. You know, nowadays, when you entertain yourself, you you watch some footy or something on the mm. TV. Um, back in the oldie times, what was there to entertain you? apart from you know tournaments when they happened like mm. everyone would want to go see that it's pretty important stuff and you can learn something just from watching people you can learn that oh trying to spin around and cut someone's not very good because you get smacked mm. i think i suppose and... i think oh sorry sorry i did I thought no no i was done I, I suppose i think the main difference i think is is that I think if you watched a lot of football games but never actually played or trained in a team, you wouldn't be as qualified as someone who actually did. I, I think you definitely have an idea of generally of how the game worked and like just from your experience to say, oh, okay, I've noticed the more guys do this, that tends to happen. But I still think it's different to actually being um, in a like a sports team, for example. And I think mm. if we apply that to a historical perspective, I think people back then would have generally been aware of the way armor worked and stuff and say, okay, if you're going to go for a guy in armor, you need to go for the gaps in the armor. Like I definitely think that would have been very universal, but I also think that I don't think you could then give them a sword and say, okay, go and fight this trained guy. Like it, 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 they, it's still a system that you'd have to be a part of. So I suppose maybe yeah. the difference would be is you'd still need some kind of awareness of the combat, even if you weren't studying the martial system. Is that what you mean? Or I mean, credit credit where credit's due. Um, you know, when when you've actually done a sport, and then you watch, um, you know, the professionals play it, you get a bit of a uh, better understanding of how things are actually going. Yeah, yeah. Um, than if you didn't or something. Yeah, like yeah. one thing I remember from my very first reenactment event. No, second, I think it was Abby. Was that people in the crowds were a bit you know confused as to what was going on um mm. they were unfamiliar with our uh, combat rules and when people were supposed to take hits um and that sort of took them out of the action a mm. little bit and a little bit further away from understanding it um but Hmm. I, I, yeah, I just can't okay. imagine I can't imagine any human living in any point in time and not having a basic understanding of the fighting of that time Yeah, like modern day people know how to use guns the bloody simple things not hard yeah I mean I, yeah I mean I, there, I mean there would still be a difference between a trained soldier and someone who isn't but, but I, mm. I think at the same time though I think it would be safe to say if we we're going to answer the question, is it needed for a living history context? Uh, we could probably answer and say, look, in terms of actually studying the actual system formally, no, not necessarily. It, that depends on what you want to do. But if, but if you're doing the era, a general awareness of it uh, mm. would still be beneficial. Would that be a good answer that we, we reckon? Yeah, I mean, I could be completely off point with my understanding of the question. So, no, I, th I think it helps. I think it helps. I think a general awareness still helps than if you didn't have any. I definitely agree with that. 
Um, before we go to the next one, uh, hello, mate, from the UK. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, you're right. Good day. Hey. I do apologize for the uh, <laughs> being late. It was a connection problems. But, That's okay. uh, but on, guys. Lovely to meet you all. Yeah, sorry. Okay, we'll, we'll just introduce ourselves again. Uh, um, sorry. So we have uh, in the top left, we have Aiden. Uh, in the bottom right, we have, yeah, Jeremy. Um, and also, just for all of our listeners, mate, um, would you feel free to just introduce yourself and your background in uh, sort of martial systems sort of in general? Me? Yeah, yeah. My, uh, my name's Kieran Kennedy. Um, I've been practicing Japanese fencing, Kenjutsu, for quite a few years. Started at so 15, 16 with uh, Eido and Kendo. And the age old argument is dough enough. I wanted to do more. Mm-hmm. Uh, went out yeah. there, found Kenjutsu. Mm-hmm. Uh, loved it, never stopped doing it. Um, mm-hmm. And pretty much that's me. At, at the moment, there seems to be a very big renaissance with fencing. And a lot of the, um, the Asian martial artists really want to get back into what we used to do, which is what a lot of HEMA guys seem to be doing now. Mm. Uh, me personally, I would love to see the two kind of mix, you know, HEMA guys let us spar and, you know, so forth. Mm. Um, so I'm really interested to see, you know, a lot of your, your views on, on a lot of the training methods that people want to introduce or hold back and mm. so forth, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, we'll definitely be coming to that actually later in some of these questions. Um, Because one of the questions we're actually answering here before we go to the next one, um, we were saying, is historical Japanese martial arts required for a living history context? Why or why not? So when we say living history, we mean historical reenactment. Like, is it required? And um, Gem and I have kind of answered, and I think Aiden said something similar, correct me if I'm wrong, about HEMA when studying European living history is that, look, if you're not, portraying someone who would have been in that martial system in the time you don't necessarily you wouldn't necessarily have to study the actual system uh, but have a general awareness of it but if you're going to portray someone who would have been within that actual martial system you kind of should look at the martial arts you, you can't just ignore it yeah i think uh, i think all all of us as children when, when we've seen we've been to museums and had guys do assemblies at school Mm. Um, you get a good look of, of this person and you imagine, oh, this is a knight, this is a samurai. Mm. But un- unless they're telling you, ah, oh, this is how we used to do it, this is how it was done, mm. you know, some people just go away and just have their own kind of ideas of what these historical characters yeah, were yeah. without understanding the nature of why they did it. You know, yeah, it's, it's not right, fun. Yeah. It's like you said, it's a, it's a, it's life, yeah. You understand, mm. you wake up, you've got to do this to... to to be able to live right. to the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. So, and I should say, before we go to the next question, uh, we have a half hour limit on my Zoom account. So if it goes longer than half an hour, I'll just send you another link and everything in the, in the chat we have on Facebook so you can rejoin everything. And if you have to go, don't feel pressured or anything. You don't have to stay here till like midnight or anything. Don't think we're going to do that, but still, don't worry. No pressure. Uh, on to the next question. So, how does authenticity work in living history? Is this different between European history and Japanese history? Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, I suppose, Aiden, did you want to kick it off from a European perspective? So um, how does authenticity work? Is it different to Japanese, you reckon? I don't know if I'm going to put it by European perspective, but more a group to group perspective. I found even mm. in the European community, we have vastly different standards of what's acceptable. Mm. Um, but generally, if you can find, if there are extant pieces, things that currently exist from the period, obviously it existed, you can use it, it's all good to go. Mm-hmm. But you also have to back it up with other documentation, images, writings, etc. that one, it works with what you're trying to portray. Like you wouldn't be a peasant walking around with a really fancy sword. You'd have yeah, a yeah, small right. knife and that's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> from a martial arts perspective, Authenticity is super hard with European, mm. like especially like 15th century stuff that I study, the he- the long sword, for example. We've got manuals, manuals, and that's about it. There's no one who really survives that did it. Closest we've got is modern fencing. Not really the same thing at all. <clears throat> mm, yeah, yeah. So we take we have to translate it. People don't speak the same language. We translate, mm. we interpret what the image is saying, what the text says. Often they conflict and contradict each other Mm. 
Um, so really it's just what do the majority of sources agree on? Does our interpretation fit the source and does it work? So I'm a big fan of pressure testing, does it work? So you can yeah, do it right. three ways yeah. and it can look the same at a snapshot because we have still images. That's a snapshot of the technique. We don't know if that's the beginning, the middle, or the end of the technique. We have three Actually, different yeah, ways, true, yeah. but it all matches the manuscript description and the manuscript image. Mm. Which no, one's that's... right? The one that mm. works. The, the one that we pressure tested, yeah, the one that yeah. works, is the one that I think is right. So I suppose yeah. would your answer be like, if, if, if it's in terms of doing an activity or wearing a garment or doing something like that, you need to document it with research uh, that is a combination of using original sources and also modern academic research by qualified yep. individuals on it. And if it's to do with the martial arts research, uh, use the manual and then pressure test. If it works, then that's very likely a correct or a valid interpretation. Even right? if it's not martial, you still have to pressure test it. So I've been doing some oh, research actually, yeah, on yeah, yeah, a yeah. polishing mix co compound. Yeah. Um, what a period polishing compound would work. I tried a few, a few different ones. Some work better than others. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the clothing, for example, you can make it how it looks, but if it does, if you haven't done it the right way, you can't move, especially with like 15th century European doublets. They're so tight and restrictive that if you don't make the armpit hole just right, then you, you can't move. You can't raise your arms above the head, but if it's made correctly, you've got all the movement in the world. So you really got to pressure test it as well. Yeah. I, sorry. I should, I should change that. So when pressure tests, we're not just talking about combat. We're just talking about trying things out in general. Yeah. 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 And as with actually from the 12th century when studying 12th century european history gem and obviously we know different living history groups have different standards to do with authenticity and blah blah, blah etc uh in general though gem from your perspective uh is, is it does it work the same way uh with 12th century european stuff or is it a little bit different oh. that's me sorry that's it so, oh, so the, the question was, how does authenticity work in living history? Um, I'm, I'm going to have to say the difference between the Japanese and European stuff is pretty minimal. It is definitely um, sort of an intergroup thing when it mm. comes to authenticity. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I can really add anything to this i think we covered all of that already i think it would be safe though to say that there are some certain differences at least in terms of when we're looking at um i suppose european and japanese history only because the way we look, relate to the history is different between the two different countries well i shouldn't say country because europe's not a country but you, you get what i mean like um in japan people relate to history usually from what i've seen in more of a cultural lens um so for example if um martial arts there and a lot of martial arts schools because they're not teaching you how to fight on the on a battlefield because again no one fights on a battlefield nowadays the purpose yeah. has changed uh it becomes it's more about cultural preservation uh when i'm looking at a lot of hema schools while there are a few exceptions it tends to be more about looking at it from a purely historical perspective rather than a cultural perspective and i think that changes it in so far as if you're trying to critique something in hema and you're looking at manuals you it's purely an academic like historical academic kind of thing if you're trying to critique it in japan though it's a much more touchy subject because it's seen as a cultural thing um and i think that's probably what the like the main difference i can think between the two um i don't know what what what, what do you think about this, Key? What do you reckon? Um, well, I was going to ask, ask, ask Aiden, like, from being in England, a lot of the Hema-esque kind of swords, martial arts that I've seen when I was younger that exist now, have usually come from, like, uh, military academies or being in the military or preparatory schools. And it, it was strange to me to see that those, you know, sabres and stuff would still exist, but a lot of the other stuff didn't. Um, and I always wondered how how close to what they do in these academies, preparatory schools, military, is close to what you guys are studying from the manuals. I mean, uh, do they still practice the same way it should have been done kind of thing? Or do you find there's many differences or any? Um, the Sabre stuff particularly um, hung around for quite a while. 
Um, yeah. I haven't seen what you guys do in the UK with all their stuff. Um, we don't, like our military sabers are purely for decoration. They don't practice with them. Right. Um, yeah, but I would cool imagine things. from what I've seen through the texts, saber stuff doesn't really change all that much throughout the centuries. Um, it's not until we get to modern Olympic sports saber that it drastically changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I reckon probably, yeah, so saber in particular doesn't really change, but compared to other weapons, long sword, arming sword, rapier, it's totally different. Mm. It's interesting when you're saying that because it's saying that the the weapon doesn't only changes when the purpose for learning it changes. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, which is very similar when you're looking at Japanese stuff as well, at least from what I've seen, is when the purpose for learning it changes, then that's when things start to change a bit more with culture and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an interesting point. Um, did anyone else have anything to add to that, or are we safe to go to the next uh, question? I think. I don't know, have, have, um, have you guys ever 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 realized? You know, you, you're practicing something, and they they tell you, "Oh, we do it this way purely to cut the guy." Like what you were telling me, Nate. You know, certain cuts are done in a certain way for minimalistic killing reasons. But uh, it, it's never really been able to be practiced kind of thing, is it? So it's always... It's a, it's a good and a bad thing, like, because, yeah. like, don't get me wrong, it's good that we don't have to fear for our lives, like, every third day of the week. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, though, that's the ultimate pressure testing, isn't it? It's like, yeah. you only, yeah. it only works if you can come out of it alive and then teach your system later. Um and which is why when we see these guys who write these systems, whether it's in Europe or whether it's in Japan, like I have a, I have a lot of respect for them in terms of as, as, as fighters, because they got through that, that crap and they made it through. That's how they know their system worked. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. And that'll definitely come up with more of our yeah. questions later. Um, but I reckon it's safe to move on to the next one. Um, uh, I, I just want to get jump on that quickly. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go um, on, yeah. From my perspective, the whole, must be done this way because it works. We can't demonstrate it's too dangerous, or whatever. I find that stuff's absolutely BS. Yes. The yeah. vast majority of the time I've come up against someone who's done that, like, oh, I can't use my technique. It's too dangerous. They can't even apply it in sparring because they've never done it. Mm. Like, well, even if you've taken the appropriate yeah. stuff, <laughs> um, I think it's that... like th- there are some things that, sure, like eye gouging, sure, it probably works. But is it as effective as you say it is? It's pretty doubtful. Um, it's been demonstrated in mixed martial arts competitions where people have used illegal eye gouges, didn't do them any favors. Um, but mm. as if you can back it up with pressure testing or at least really good logic as to why it works and good biomechanics, then sure. But I find the vast majority of the time people can't mm. they can't say why it's done that way, and they can't mm. pressure test it, and they can't explain the mechanics. Yeah, uh, the whole, um, oh, we can't demonstrate our technique because it's too dangerous. That's like the biggest warning sign that you're being taught. <laughs> mind. Because it's, it's always, you know, the masters who are terrified of actually fighting someone who does a different mm. style to them who turn out to be teaching absolute shit. Yeah, it's an easy like, like card to get out of it to pull out, really. Yeah. And like, don't get me wrong, safety is important. Um, and I think every single one of us here will say to those people watching, if you're going to train in a system, do it safely. Do it with someone who's trained. Don't just go out there with a sword and just do your own stuff. You're either going to injure yourself or other people. Safety is important, but at the same time, um, you can't just expect to be teaching a system when someone asks you about it, you've got nothing for it because you just mm. pull out the card of, oh, it's too dangerous. We can't show it because then it, well, then what are you doing there? <laughs> we, yeah. we, we know what's dangerous. Like the MMA mm. rules about like eye gouging and stuff. Mm. It's like, that's pretty straightforward. You know that if someone <laughs> sticks your thumbs in your eyes, it's going to hurt like hell and it's going to do some permanent damage. So just saying, oh, we can't demonstrate. You can say, no, no, this is what it is. And we know it works because mm, it right. bloody hurts. And people talk about it too. Like you hear references, yeah. you see references. I've seen videos actually of World War II hand-to-hand training where they specifically talk about when you're grappling thumb in the eye. Like mm. it, it's something that's referenced constantly. And if it's something that didn't work, well, then people were doing what haven't worked for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, like don't get me wrong. It's not just your always go-to, but 
again, it's, yeah, it's something that, okay, look, thumb in the eye. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> I don't think yeah. anyone will be into that unless they're really weird, kinky people. There's a um, 15th century <laughs> wrestling master called Otjud. Yeah, yeah. Um, who specifically mentions eye gouges and that sort. Of, he calls them death tricks. Mm, um, death tricks. Yeah, you, you wouldn't do it in friendly sparring. Oh, right. Um, okay, well, fair, fair enough. Then. <laughs> basically, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. an accessory to help your technique, but it's you should rely mainly on your foundation stuff you practice yeah, right, time yeah. and time again. That's yeah. just a little bit more to make it slightly more potent. Yes. That, that sort. It's, it's like, like biting someone in a match fight. Finish. Yeah. <laughs> it's like biting someone in a fight. Think, like, yeah, it's effective, but you don't need to, like, I don't know. I think a so called <laughs> friend of ours the other day proved something. He, he was going on about an ancient technique that's been taught and taught and taught and taught. And it's one thing to say how to do it, but then in reality, when you're doing it, you're going to have to adapt it to whatever makes it work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's never, it's never going to be the same in, in, in the dojo. You know, you've got to, if the guy's really tall, you can't just, you know, you've got to adapt to that and stuff like that. So, yeah. Mm. This is a really cool dynamic. I like this guys. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, our next question. This is for our living history people. Uh, first up, uh, the pet peeves in living history and or martial arts. Actually, this will include you, Key. Some of our pet peeves. Uh, Jem, you want to... Actually, no, we'll get Key because he hasn't started one off yet. Key, what are some of your yeah. pet peeves in martial arts that you've seen? Well, what, what do you mean by pet, pet peeves? Like... So just things that just really get under your skin that like people do that you just go, oh, why do you do that? Come on, that's stupid or that's um, annoying or something like that. Okay. I guess, I guess it's a bit of ignorance and we probably all have it, but um, mm -hmm. when someone sees a sword for the first time, whoa, oh my God. <laughs> like, no, it's not CGI. It is real. <laughs> oh, there is a real uh, question. I, yeah, we get that all mm. the time. <laughs> does, it, does it cut through everything? Like, no. <laughs> so yeah, you, you yeah. get a lot of those samurai magical stuff and all sorts. And yeah. be fair, yeah. there are a lot of people that play on that. Yeah. You'll see kids come to them and, and Nathan, you've probably been through it as well. And they're expecting you to come out with these magical anime answers. Yeah, I, I did five heads in one cut. And mm. some people get really disappointed when you kind of show them the reality of it. But then it helps me kind of vet people. Like out of 10 yeah. people, if one person understands the reality of what I'm telling them, mm. then I know, you know, this guy's kind of serious. Mm. But yeah, you do get a lot of, anime fans larping and yeah. stuff like that yeah it's, it's, it's... <laughs> and again i, I suppose thought... we're saying like there's nothing wrong with like asking questions that you don't like just because you don't know about it like we're not here saying don't ask questions it's just yeah it's it's funny because we get asked these questions a lot and and so on just just from our perspective i should just mention that to the viewers <laughs> um yeah what about you gem some of your pet peeves in living history and all martial arts um Oh, look, uh, this is something that seems to happen just everywhere. Any subject, mm. anytime, anywhere yeah. is the uh, well actually guy. And the person <laughs> who's, who's read a bunch of books by someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, they come in and they start talking about, well, well, actually, you know, the Japanese mm. samurai sword of the Second World War could cut through a machine gun's barrel. Oh, I've heard that so many yeah. times. Oh, okay, let's get uh. through this. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about metallurgy and so on, and you know the thickness <laughs> of the steel, and we'll get through this. But it's be painful. That's such uh, a great I, way to describe them. The well, actually, people, I love that. I'm going to use it, that from now on. It happens all the time. There's at least mm. one every event just yeah. comes up and goes, "Well, actually," <laughs> and that that frustrates me to no end. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. What about you, Aiden? Some of your pet peeves in living history and or martial arts? My pet peeves aren't so much from public and those who aren't indoctrinated mm. into living history or martial arts, but from within the community. And that's having a closed yeah. mind. Like, so say it again, sorry? The... Having a closed mind. Oh, yeah. yeah saying yeah. my way is the only way. It's the best way. Yeah. Can't explain why they think they're better than you. Mm, because mm. they know the super secret or this best thing it doesn't work mm. they're not willing to change their idea the amount of times i've like a zornhau like one of the most fundamental cuts in german longsword i've changed my opinion on how to do that a number of times and refined it and everyone's every next one's better than the last but you have to be willing to change mm. um, and 
I don't know, too many times I've had people say, no, you're doing it wrong. You have to do it this way because this way is the best way. And then when it comes to pressure test it, my way ends up beating their way because I've adapted and changed to what fits the manuscripts, to what has actually worked. But I just, I don't know. That's, that's probably my biggest pet peeve. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I reckon. It, it, <laughs> oh, sorry, Keith. No, no, it, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, someone who sits there and knows nothing and says, ooh, I want to learn something. And then they go and it's like, oh, I already know everything. Like, well, why did you put it? Well, yeah, that's you know, right. So I exactly. I agree yeah. with you there, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you come here for then? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's See, I think if I was going to say anything that's not already been mentioned, uh, I think would be, the, I suppose, what I like to call the era condescenders in living history. So those people who know next to nothing about another era and condescend it all the freaking time. Like one example is like, I suppose, and I'm saying this as a medieval and also a 20th century reenactor, uh, like medievals telling 20th century soldiers, oh, you're playing the soldiers with your little bang sticks running around the bush and blah, blah, blah. Oh, all the moderns, blah, 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 the moderns. Um, and then the moderns going back and being like, oh, you're just playing knights and ladies and blah, 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 and King Arthur and all that kind of fantasy crap. Um that stuff really annoys me. So it's like, look, mate, if you don't know anything about the era and you're just going to condescend, just shut up. Because <laughs> yeah. you're not doing yourself any favors. So there's that. I think when, with martial arts, probably one of the pet peeves I have is, is uh, no touch chi knockouts. And I'm probably <laughs> going to get flax for that. I'm probably going to get flack for that. I'm probably going to get demonetized for saying that. But I uh, just th these guys, these who are literally almost cult leaders, in my opinion, who run these things and then tell people you can defend yourself from this guy who's about to mug you. And then they go out on the street and someone tries to mug them and they try to do this stuff and they end up either getting seriously injured or killed. And it's, yeah, it's one, that's one of my pet peeves. Or just, just embarrassed. Or just embarrassed that too. Yeah, that's pretty mortifying. But, oh gosh. But on the subject of closed mindedness that I absolutely agree. Mm, um, like, when I started out, I was, you know, pretty confident with sword and shield. And mm. then I fought a, uh, a Hema bloke with a two-handed sword. And I got my ass kicked every single time mm. I went up against exactly. him. I couldn't figure it out. Mm. And if I had taken the closed mind approach and just said, no, f*** it. No, oh, I shouldn't swear. Sorry. <laughs> I can, I can leave um, it out. It's all good. Please do. Um <laughs> If I had taken the approach of going, oh, no, stuff that this way is right, then um, I probably wouldn't have uh, as good an understanding of the weaknesses mm. and uh, bonuses of different types of weapons that I do now. Mm. And I think we've all had that moment. I think everyone here has had that moment where yeah. we've yeah. had to learn something from someone else and you just more about it than we did. And we just had to adapt what we did. I think the every man has here has done that once. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, contrasting to that, our favorite memories or some of our great memories in living history and or martial arts. Uh, Aiden, you want to kick this off? Oh, so many good moments. I know. I know. See, guys, um, it's actually a good thing. Not everything pisses us off. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the problem is it's so much harder to figure out what's the best because there's so many good. I know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, um, best All right, i'll give the best moment in the last within the last year mm -hmm. um for me i started i started brazilian jiu-jitsu hadn't done it before it's my haven't so new martial art mm -hmm. i entered into a competition as a two stripe white one or two stripe one stripe white belt yeah mm -hmm. i only had one stripe out of four in my white belt mm -hmm. um ended up winning the competition Took home gold and gi, silver and nogi, and I, I, I don't know. That was probably my favorite moment in my martial arts mm. in the last in the last year, or well, last two years now. But it was just really validating starting something new, and beating people who have done it, have been doing it for a little bit longer than me. Four stripe white belts, almost blue belts. Um, I think I won seven out of eight matches. Wow. Um, I'd only been doing it for a couple of months. So I don't know, that, that was really validating that my previous martial art experience mm. actually applies and works. Yeah. Um, mm. Living history, just every night I get, I get to drink with friends at a camp. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, but I get that. Like when you're learning something that you realize that actually does work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's by far the best feeling. Mm. Nice. What like about you? We said this the other night, didn't we? Know, like when you've thought of theories and then you see someone else on the internet doing it, and you're like, oh my god, I'm on the right track here. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Fair play, and yeah, it's really good, man. Or you even get moments where, like, you there's a gap in your understanding like because you can't find a source that says a certain thing when you're researching for other for martial arts or whatever and yeah or either that or you'll think okay based on my experience i think it's this and then a couple of years later you do find a source that is talking about that thing and it turns out you actually literally were bang on <laughs> that's that's a really cool best feeling moment and and i think that if I was going to add anything that hasn't been said, I think is when we're in living history context and uh, different reenactors have the different ways of referring to this, but like they're almost these brief moments where your brain actually thinks you are back in time. And it's where you've reached like the peak of immersion and it can last for a certain amount of time. It can only last maybe one or two seconds, but in those, that short amount of time, you learn so much because your brain for a split second thinks you actually are there. Um, and I've seen it affect people in various different ways. Um, I've seen a guy actually vomit once uh, at a World War II reenactment. Uh, well, not a reenactment. This was an event, private event where we were doing a, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, yeah, it was Kokoda 42. That's right. So we live, we live in the Kokoda campaign. We're out on patrol and uh, one guy actually like vomited a little bit, not like full on just regurgitate or anything, but like, like vomited a little bit. Uh, and he was one of the newer guys with me and it was really cool to see that because it made me think, holy crap, wow, <laughs> immersion really upscaled. Is. And you, and again, you learn a lot in those experiences. I think those are some of my favorite ones as well in terms of living history. Um, what about you, Key? Did you want to have anything you wanted to add to that? Or it seemed you were saying some stuff before. Some of your favorite memories. Um, two, two things for main once more. Like um, as a youngster, uh, you know, you, 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 even yourself, you may see someone new, you take them under their arm, oh, I'll, I'll show you the ropes kind of thing. Mm. And uh, I was always told about certain people, stay away from this guy, he's, he's a knob, oh, he's arrogant, this and that. And um, my first kendo grading, I already heard about this monster guy. I'll say his name, Dave Bell. He's an excellent guy and an excellent fencer. And I think some people just have this really, I don't know, I'm not so good, but this guy beat me and they couldn't handle it. So I heard a lot of bad things about this man. And on my first grading, he stood there in Joe Dan and says, give me your best kendo. And I crapped myself. <laughs> um, fenced in my best. And in the changing rooms, he came up to me and I thought, oh, God, what's going on here? He shook my hand and said, oh, what did you get? I said, oh, I only got a six. He said, Matt, you, you should have got better than that. And it let me realise that, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Sorry about the background. Don't judge a book fight, but right. it's always best to know someone's character through through their actions rather than someone else's kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And meeting that that guy who was like some big eighth and I'm not saying I'm the best, but um having him being honest with me yeah. showed me that yeah, this, this guy I was listening to. I do apologize for that background. That's right. That's all good, mate. It's all good. But uh, yeah, fencing this guy and having him be humble to me showed me that sometimes other people's egos can actually hold you back. Mm. Um, so I was really happy that this this guy I was afraid of came and, and, and welcomed himself to me and he, he opened me up now. So I'm not afraid mm. to speak to, you know, if there's an eight fan in the corner, I'll go and speak to him and say, how are you doing? And you learn a lot just from talking to people. Yeah, so yeah. I've always remembered that for the rest of my life. That's always stopped mm. with me that as that guy. He's a really good guy. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I reckon that's a good one to add. Uh, what, what about what about you, Jen? What are your favourite memories in living history or martial arts in general? Oh, look, there's a few actually, but um, <laughs> it's pretty normal. I'd, I'd have to say, you know, we we joined up to um, the 12th century group sort of just after the reenactment season had finished, so mm. we were getting trained for a solid year before we got our first show and coming up to that show we were doing two trainings a week for two to three hours mm. and when we took the field um for our first battle with like another group yeah and you and i we both beat the same fella who was supposed to be like 
super experience and stuff mm. like 10 years <laughs> yeah, plus that. experience in reenacting and we both beat him in one-on-one -on -one combat i still have that a video was, of that <laughs> oh mate honestly that was pretty great feeling yeah um the the second one i suppose would be and it's related is um you know first defeating the guy who trained you to fight yeah like when yes. you're having an honest like bout with someone who trained you to fight and you mm. actually like you know get a good hit on them yeah and yeah, they go, yeah. bugger me good job it's like, <laughs> yes absolutely love that <laughs> yeah i agree i think um i've I'm, my mix is also with i think a lot of what everyone else here has said as well but i think we've answered that question um well uh on to the next one because i think we've already answered the next one which is what's one of your biggest learning curves in living history i think we've a lot of us have sort of answered that in different ways uh next one so what are the challenges in living history and or martial arts research in european and japanese history are they similar or different i think we've kind of half answered this already um aiden i, I think you remember saying that it's hard when you're doing the martial arts research because you only have the manuals and the images are a snapshot of a part of the technique rather than the entirety. So oh, yeah. it involves a lot of seeing a part of it and then trying it out and then trying to figure out and put pieces of the puzzle together or something. Um, that's That was correct, right? I'm remembering yeah. correctly. Yeah, and it's like, I suppose it's, um, do you think uh, from your perspective, Key, when you're, when you're doing Kenjutsu, do you think that the difficulty is the same or do you think it's different with Japanese martial arts? I, th I think depending on like your, your school or who you're learning with, there can be quite a few limitations. As we said earlier, like, like Jeremy said, some teachers are afraid to show that they can't. So they'll hold you back. Mm -hmm. um, I actually see Adrian, I actually see uh, Hema as quite liberating because you're, you're given this chance to kind of discover and you may even invent some stuff that wasn't there before. And uh, if it works, fair play. Um, but yeah, I found in Kenjutsu, I've had to kind of walk away from a lot of the traditionalists just to try and get, you know, give people what they want to. So, we can, um, you know, if we do a cut to the left, there's more than just that one cut, but they're just only letting us do that one cut kind of thing. Mm. So I found it quite, quite limiting at times, to be fair, yeah. That, that's yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah do, do you think that's connected with seeing it as a do you think that's connected with doing the martial arts as a cultural preservation rather than a study of the historical martial art do you think that's a byproduct of that yeah it's it's because of the whole the whole um you know the different shogunates and then the major restoration it seems like it's more a preservation of culture mm. rather than keeping the, the arts alive it, it's more cultural if that makes sense yeah because i imagine so if something's we... more cultural people aren't going to care about using it in an actual combative situation um yeah hmm. yeah that's a i think that's a good point you've touched base on what about you jim what do you reckon uh some of the challenges in doing martial arts research um especially with 12th century stuff oh i mean <laughs> There's a as big problem there. Century, What's the problem? <laughs> What's the problem? What What do you have to go on? Exactly. There's nothing. <laughs> like you've you've got a few images, stills from the time. Some dude getting cut in half, but you don't know how it got there. Mm. And um, and it's more artistic like people, rather than like a manual as well. Yeah, like there's certainly um, artistic flair applied to a lot mm. of these things. Like you look at the um, Black Bible. Mm -mm. um and you know they show someone being cut down to their like bottom jaw through their helmet and there was a source for william the conqueror and it was supposed to be remarkable that he could do that to someone uh, cut down to their top jaw mm -hmm. and you know that that could even be bogus as far as we know yeah um yeah as far because like we can't really test much in the way of metallurgy um for the different weapons and, and armor because yeah a lot of it's rusted pretty significantly and you can't gather much information from that um and yeah there's just no reference material 
really yeah and even um, if there is reference material fight. it's not like a manual that at least because at least with the 15th and even 14th centuries they at least give you images uh mm. that's at least something and they at least have codexes manuals that talk about effect books whatever you want to call it uh late 12th century for what you and i do there's literally nothing um so what we kind of have to do in some cases and again there are a lot of 12th century groups out there that will often use this as an excuse to not do to not do any kind of research into martial arts because they're like oh we don't have anything so we're just going to do whatever um i'm more of the opinion that it's like well look i think there are things that do carry over i think it's fair enough to use the later manuals as a basis particularly if they're talking about unarmored combat because let's face it i don't think that's changed like that that at basically in a really significant way and put it in the context of what we do and again pressure tests i think it's fair enough to do that but again that takes a lot of work even more work than it takes to do 15th century historical european martial arts and i think that's why there are a lot of 12th century groups out there they're kind of like eh, nah, nah, nah. just go out mm. there and do whatever i suppose well i suppose the biggest trouble uh the further back you get is that you just kind of have to admit that you don't exactly know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of it's just trial by trial and error, figure out what works. Um, but even then, you, you can be influenced by what you see from other um, other fighting groups, other um, time periods and stuff. Mm. So it's pretty hard oh, yeah. to keep that out of your head when you're trying to basically invent a martial arts um and yeah, i suppose or rediscover the groups, i suppose yeah mm. the, the, the groups definitely develop their own style mm. of fighting which is another interesting um, topic in itself <laughs> yeah like uh the 12th century group that we're a part of its style kind of seems to be embodied by the captain of the group who was there when we joined yeah like it was his yeah. style of fighting that, that was is a good point to mm. everyone and if you wanted to learn pole arm, you went and talked to JP. Yeah. <laughs> and, That's right. The only guy who uh, fought with a glaive. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't really get a full picture mm. or even like a sketch of what's actually going on. There's so that, actually that's pretty difficult. Yeah. There's actually a really funny example. Well, not funny, interesting example. I was seeing a group of guys who were looking at our Aztec Jaguar warriors and they were looking at that martial arts system. They were trying to figure out how to use the, I don't know the name of it, those obsidian edged uh, uh, sort of uh, wooden. Oh, it's something yeah. hard to pronounce. Yeah, you know, you, know, you know those ones I'm talking about, they're lined with obsidian and they were fighting with that and they were, they were trying to do their own kind of thing, trying to figure out, okay, how would they have fought? And see that's, and mm -hmm. if we're looking at Aztec or if we were look, even look going earlier, like the Mayans, even earlier than that, we're talking like literally like, oh, trying to discover that fighting system is going to be so hard. But um, if, as long as I think, at least in my opinion, if you're saying, look, this is based on our study, we're not saying this is exactly how they did it. This is based on our study and based on pressure testing and figuring out what works and so on. I think it's fair enough. But I think if we're having guys who are going as far back as that or guys doing ancient Egyptian stuff, uh, you can kind of start to see, well, look, it, there does have to be a certain amount of, I suppose, leeway in terms of the research you do and how you apply it. What What do you guys reckon about, I mean, the older the art, would you reckon there's there's less actual art into it? What Not in an ignorant that, sense, like... but almost like a, like barbarians, like we've got a stick, I hit you, you die. There's not much uh, math behind it. So... Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. This is a query, like, what do you guys think? I've got an idea about how I'd answer this, but Aiden, what uh, I think you would definitely like to have an answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you mean like how structured the art is, or how much we can recreate of it? Because that's no, yeah. So how, how structured they their art would have actually have been? Like maybe would they have started to develop certain techniques, but then realized, well, not even realized, but you know, all oh, half these techniques were. And over yeah, time, so, um, they, they would develop more, but it was yeah, more. Yeah, so obviously, the longer an art's been around, the more it has developed. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we look at modern day fighters in mixed martial arts, they'll beat fighters from 20 years ago easily, just because more development. But 
let's take wrestling, for example. We have got wrestling texts way back to ancient Egypt mm. oh. using pretty much exactly the same techniques yeah. as we use now. Um, like I can look at some ancient Egyptian wrestling images on a wall and they look like exactly like what we have today. Um, yeah. Rule sets might have been different, but I'm sure there was just as structured. Um, ancient Greek pancreation as well, pretty much the same. Um, but the, obviously, they has to a point in human evolution before before all that, where it starts to fall down, and we haven't systemized it yet. <clears throat> we have to go back a long way for that. Right. Um, okay. We can observe apes, like chimpanzees, not even people doing legit wrestling groups yeah oh well um See, no. yeah it, it's not nearly as That's clean and as refined but it's been there from the beginning yeah so it, it, it evolves but it's definitely been there from the beginning it slowly gets more systemized mm. um, what did you have something no, to add to that, that Jen? it's <laughs> a lot of knowledge there Not to think about Jen, whether you, oh sorry, sorry whether it's more structured or as like structured did, yeah like did you have something to add to that what uh aiden already said um no no i don't think so i mean there's only so many ways you can do something hmm. um and you do find things get repeated a lot um hmm. between different martial arts like hmm. uh you look at some of the talhofer i think it is um, and then you compare it to some of the stuff you see from the Japanese style martial arts and you can see the exact same technique, mm. just different weapon using it. And it's because yeah. there are some sort of universal truths about, um, you know, how to hit someone, how to kill them if you need to. So mm. um, it, it definitely wasn't taught in the same way, you know, we didn't develop language and the ability to write it down and everyone couldn't read for a long time so it was pretty difficult and it was learnt from um show and tell basically but uh, i don't see any reason why it wouldn't be as precise as anything we have today yeah because I, I i think it, it, it i think i feel we need to be tricky we need to be careful if we're when we're, if we're going to say the more complex something is the more effective it is um, mm. I think we need to be careful when we say that because that's not always true. Uh, because I, I, I know that like if you get a guy who has done boxing, he's never been in a boxing bout before. He's only just been doing shadow boxing, boxing with a bag and that. Uh, and you get him up against a guy who may not have done boxing, but has been fighting on the street for about six or seven years, being in gang violence, all sorts of stuff. The guy who does boxing is probably going to have a bit of a hard time because he doesn't have the experience uh even though he is in a dedicated system he doesn't have the experience and i think at the end of the day yeah we might have more technical systems now just because we have so many ways of recording info i think if you got some guy who was instructing the new recruits in an ancient egyptian dynasty during uh in an army and the guy was instructing them how to use weapons a veteran uh I know I've done more technical systems than he does. And I know I wouldn't want to fight him. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But does that answer your question? You think key, like, is that a satisfying answer or what we've said? Yeah. <laughs> it's also, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, uh, what are the challenges next? Um, oh, okay. This is interesting. In your opinion, what are the biggest differences between those in the past and people today? Would this affect the average level of combat skill or acclimatization? Geez, whoever thought that question up, you're, you're, <laughs> you're asking the big questions here. Nice. Um, Jem, do you want to start us off with that? What's what, in your opinion? We were talking uh, about this recently, actually. We, we <laughs> were training. talking about this. <laughs> so so I kind of... I kind of know what yours and my opinion is, but I, mm. I want to feel out the room mm. a little bit, see if someone can offer a different perspective without being tainted by something stupid I've said. So I'll, I would prefer if someone else answers All right. that one first. Uh, Key, what do you reckon, mate? What's, what are some of the differences between those in the past and people nowadays, you think, in your opinion? 
Uh, so what the, the as in attitudes towards life or fighting yeah, or that, a bit of everything. Um, that and if you think that might affect pe- the average combat skill of people back then compared to now or vice versa. Um, I, th- I think we could touch touch on a little something we touched on earlier, where it was an everyday life for them, wasn't it? So I, I mean, um, I don't know if a lot of you know, a, a lot of women used to be married to many many men because they expected them to die. So it wasn't the fact that, oh, you know, she's a dirty woman. It's, oh, my husband's going to war today. I'm going to marry his cousin tomorrow. <laughs> so a lot of people have expected certain things to be happening, whereas today there's a lot of rules, civilization, and stuff like that. So the way we handle each other and practice is going to be very, very, very different to the way people used to think and do things back in the day. Um, I mean, I'm sure you step on a guy's foot. Sorry, mate, that's it. A long couple hundred years ago, it's hey, we're going to duel this out now. So, so, uh, but that was accepted, wasn't it? Kind of a thing. Um, so, I'm, 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 I'm not too sure. I, I think there was a lot more respect between each other because the, um, the ability to kill each other was so there that you would actually have more respect with each other. Whereas now, you could never harm another person without getting in trouble and stuff like that. So, there's a lot more aggression in the world going on and a bit more tension and stuff like that. Mm. What, what I think I would prefer to live back then, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, interesting, interesting. What about, what about you, Aiden? What, what do you think about this? Um, <clears throat> so we're comparing martial ability of those in the past to those now. That's part of I mean, the, the, the last um, bit of the question seems to be, what are some the of the difference, differences difference. and yeah. if that would affect the average combat? I think we pretty much already just covered on um, a lot of the differences. So how I think it would affect the average person would be, I reckon the average person back then would be more skilled and more competent than the average person now. Mm, um, yeah. that's, fighting was much more widespread. People were a lot fitter back then. Um, and oh, yeah. physical ability <laughs> means a lot in a fight. No Hungry Jacks or Big Mac. Um, Big Mac's I'm, I'm a featherweight. <laughs> I've versed ultra heavyweights. And yeah. even if my technique's better, that is a hell of a difference to overcome. Mm. So everyone, they're a lot more physical. They're always on their feet. They're fit versus the average person now, no contest. Mm. If we take the elite, however, I think it flips. We have modern training methods. We have the internet where we can compare with everyone across the world. We have like padding for boxing. We can hit each other. We can kick each other without it taking as much of a toll on our bodies. Um, We've got modern science where we can figure out what the best training method is. Like <clears throat> the rise to judo um, was versus traditional jujutsu, pretty much just in his training methods with way more free sparring randori um, and just taking the best of multiple different traditional jujutsu schools. Mm. So I think average back then better. Elite modern day would smoke this past. Unless of course we're talking about weapons then they lived and trained with those weapons. That beat us with the same way. It's interesting, I think, because as soon as Jem, as soon as he said that last <laughs> sentence, I think it's basically the same thing that you and I were saying. I think, mm. really. Well, um, just quickly on the subject of you know the strength thing, um, there seems to be a sort of modern conclusion that technical uh, knowledge and technique is, you know, how you win the fight, but realistically uh, your technique and your technical knowledge is supplementary to your actual strength if you don't have the strength to throw someone across the room it doesn't matter if you know how to do it you can't Mm. so um you know strength is definitely pretty important and people back then were definitely a bit stronger um i think the the crux of the um or what I think Nathaniel and I can, uh, confirmed the other day when we were talking about this was that there's a lot more variety in fighting styles available to the average person today. Hmm. But the average yeah. person back then is going to be more experienced because they're going to have actually you know, gotten a serious fight or perhaps a not so serious fight in the past. 
And the other point was that, um, you know, back in the day, everyone was armed. Everyone had a knife or a dagger on them mm. like at all points. There wasn't a reason to not have a knife. And you compare that to today, you know, in, in Australia, you know, it's a crime to carry a knife unless you have a very specific reason to do it. And self-defense doesn't count as a reason in mm, our legal and, system. Yeah. And I think, and obviously like there are places in the world we know viewers like guys, like we, we know that there are places in the world where it is normal for everyone to carry a knife or even a machete or, or yeah. whatever. But, mm. but if we're, we're talking about like modern Europe today um, or European cultures or, um, and, and so on. If we're looking at that, like I think, because what we were saying, I think as well, Jim, was that nowadays in terms of hand to hand, like unarmed combat stuff, I think it's much more varied than it was back then. Um, mm. Because nowadays we have Savat, we have MMA, we Karate, have Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I mean, if, even if we're Gaga. just using Western examples, if we're using, yeah, Savat, MMA, boxing. Uh, I mean, there are different kinds of boxing. There's also Thai boxing, but that's, again, that's different. Uh, Krav Maga, if you want to go so far as Israel, uh, like there's so many different things around. And because we don't use weapons in our culture anywhere near as much as people did back then. And I mean, let's face it. If you want to deck a guy and you know that there's about a 99.999% chance he's got a knife and knows how to use it, the chance if you're going to run up and try to deck him is probably pretty slim. Um, so it... I think I think we kind of were feeling that in terms of hand to hand stuff, we would generally have more at our disposal. Uh, with weapons, they would have more just in terms of experience uh, in using the weapon. But at the same time, even if we have more knowledge with hand to hand stuff, people back then would just be much more tougher. They'd be much more pain resistant um, than people today, the average person today, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think that was kind of our conclusion mm. that we said, and that would definitely affect combat insofar as um, if a guy's already been injured how many freaking times, he's not going to be as scared to get injured because I think we all know if you have been hit in the face before, uh, it's you, you can tell when someone has not, when they're doing sparring, mm. because they, they, they do these kinds of things a lot more. So yeah, I suppose the answer to the question based on what we've all said is, that in terms of weapon stuff, they are over us because they've got experience. Unarmed stuff, we have more available and more techniques available, but they have, they're tougher. They're still more, they're <laughs> yeah, still yeah, more yeah. experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, because before you graduate to a full-on knife fight, there's probably going to be a bit of a fisty cuffs before that. Mm. Uh, going straight to your most deadly weapon at your disposal isn't usually how combat goes yeah 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 i, I want to add on to that point actually um throughout the middle ages we pretty much see a disappearance of boxing mm. um boxing existed back with the ancient greeks it existed after the middle ages but during pretty much disappeared and that's because everyone carried a knife mm. um, yeah. so i don't think that they would go have fisty cuffs before drawing the knives. Like, I'm, if you know the other well, person yeah. has a knife, mm. I ain't gonna, I'm not messing around. I'm drawing a knife straight away. But, um, uh, wrestling, however, because wrestling and grappling works against my fighting, it's probably like mm. the most effective defense against an armed weapon if you're unarmed. Um, that was continuous. We never saw a break with that. So, mm -hmm. well, I, I think escalation is something that you can observe in um, cases of like street fighting where a security camera or something has captured a fight from you know start to finish and what you generally see is the two people square off then there'll be a bit of a push then maybe a fist gets thrown or a kick and that's when you know your weapons get produced Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I'd agree so, with that then, yeah. There's, so there's a bit of an escalation. Men. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, I don't yeah. think they would have hung around in that the fisticuff range for very long at all. No. It'd, go, no, it'd just, escalate pretty quick. And you I think it's... of that yeah. and get to your most deadly option pretty quick. As soon as you realise it's not 100% that you're going to win, you decide that you need to escalate it yeah. pretty quickly. 
And I think it's also important to mention here that it, it, I don't think because there are hand strikes and foot strikes in medieval martial arts. Yes. You see that being referenced to. However, it's not the main go-to. It's usually something to that is done once you have the opponent's weapon engaged yeah, or it's, once you're in a certain situation. You don't just go, you're, you're not just going to be trading blows with your fists like most people would do in your pub or something like that. It's more often to facilitate a wrestling technique mm -hmm. rather than a art in it of its own trying to knock the other person out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're not really going in there to aim to hit the nose. It's just in the midst of combat, if it's there, you'll go for it kind yeah. of thing. That's yeah. right. Biff them a little bit so they have to protect themselves somewhere else so you mm. can throw them in a different way. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think we've answered that question. Uh, oh, gosh. Okay. Is living history and historical martial arts important to learn nowadays? Why, why not? Okay. Uh, Jem, what do you think? Um, important for some. I, I don't think everyone needs to learn everything all the time mm -hmm. um but i think in terms of just you know preserving history um because that, that that to me is pretty important um you gotta sort of learn from the past and you can't learn from the past if you forget it so mm. certain people do need to absolutely dedicate themselves to it and it would be great if everyone had a basic understanding of it but it's just not feasible in my mind, because people's interests are different, I suppose. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. What about um, what about you, Key? What do you reckon? Do you think living history and historical martial arts are important to learn that nowadays? Why or why not? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially with the European stuff. I mean, I, I practice Japanese, but I'm European myself. Uh, and unfortunately. Through the years in Europe, our wars have changed and we've adapted our styles of fighting to match enemies' weapons and so forth. So a lot of our stuff has been lost. Uh, I'm sure Adrian would, would, uh, would agree. Aiden, sorry. Um, so in order to get that history back, we've actually got to go out of our way and grab it and bring it, almost force it back into people's faces. Mm. Um, you'd be surprised uh, a lot of the castles that we have left. Um, there's barely anyone visiting them, learning anything about them. In schools, they don't, all we learn about is the Battle of Hastings, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and then again, in, in Japan, all their history is quite preserved because of, I don't know, things in World War II that got destroyed. So, But yeah, Hema, I think Hema is very, very important, and I'm glad it's kind of had a, a, a second rena renaissance, so to speak. No pun intended. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's very important, I think. Uh, and a lot of kids can learn, not just the... The martial arts but you know you'll see guys out there in the clothes and teaching them more not just the actual sword but the way they lived and acted and stuff like that right okay um, what about you mate oh sorry jen did you sorry have i just got two two quick questions on that or oh, two things um so mm. i visited england uh two no crikey would be almost four five years ago now Jeez, mm. yeah can't be recent um, COVID, mate. No, it can't be recent. <laughs> no, it feels like two years ago. It's still pretty fresh. But I was pretty surprised how few people were at um, certain historical sites. Mm. Um, really, London was the only place where I saw a lot of people going yeah. to historical things. And I think that's just an access thing that it's like, oh, we're here, we might as well. Not many people went out of their way to go visit, you know, random castles out in the countryside or the um the long barrows that we just happened upon when we were driving along we just saw these long barrows and we went oh my god and we walked up and turns out you could go and have a look at them and crawl inside them it was pretty neat um the the second thing was uh, as far as the history that's being taught um in england like battle hastings it that, that can't be it. Like, surely Magna Carta has That's to be it. taught because Magna Carta is pretty absolutely yeah, significant in terms of history. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so you, you never got taught Magna Carta or anything like that? Yeah, but well, it's, it's only... So this is in, like, secondary school or, like, uh, early year junior high school kind of thing. Um, 
And it's literally just because it's on the curriculum. But if you actually want to learn more about it, you've got to go to university and just study yourself kind of thing, which a, a lot of Brits don't because they're not, it's modern times. They want to be doctors, mm. lawyers and fair play. But uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of our history is just taught snippets of. And if you that, care, you have to go out of your way to kind of finish off the, you've got to plug your own gaps, so to speak. That is, that is a shame because England's got, you know, quite a lot yeah. of history and there's a lot there. And mm. it, it's disappointing to hear that it's not getting taught. Well, I mean, what about you, Aiden? Uh, do you think it's important? Uh, why or why not? Um, I think it's important to understand the po- socio-political climate of certain events in the past so we can learn from it and not make the same mistakes we have before. Mm. World War One and Two are prime examples. Yeah. Um, and from the living history side, I think it's very important that everyone have an appreciation for how people lived in the past. Mm. I think it would make everyone a lot more grateful for what we have nowadays. Mm. Um, and just in general, a lot more thoughtful. Uh, I don't think everyone necessarily has to participate. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. or at, at least like go to an event, witness it as public. You don't have to be in part of a group, um, but you absolutely should understand and appreciate what happened in our history. Mm. Um, and to do that, we need more people in living history. As already said, there's not enough people visit castles and historical sites in Europe. Mm. We, we need more. We need more people to reenact and to do living history, so we can get a wider audience, get more people interested, and not necessarily just to get involved, but just so they can appreciate it better. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I, I think. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jim. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Jim. Wait, just just after hearing everyone else's responses, I, I've got to amend what I said. Um, <laughs> bloody hell. Uh, actually, living history and learning how people lived in the past is so absolutely important because the stuff that we have nowadays don't just pop out of the shelf to be formed. Yeah, we have the miracles of modern society, which have been a long time coming. Like, even if you're just thinking from uh, an engineering point of view, um, like sewer systems and stuff, like, can you imagine a life without a dedicated sewer? It, mm. Like, the sewer increased your lifespan by 30 years. Mm. Just the idea of moving your waste away and not appreciating that fact, I think, makes people a bit resentful of mm. what they don't have now instead of what they do have. And it's those little things that you really gain insight from living history rather than a history textbook, like, yeah, you're not right. going to understand that. But when you see people living like that at a living history event, you really start to understand what it was like on a day-to-day basis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that like, I think without living history, uh, seeing the past becomes much more about just looking at these funny little people who lived a long time ago. Um, and I've found that like through living history that often dispels that um, it makes it much more human. Uh, because one of the things that I often do, and this is from teaching history backgrounds, um, one of the things that I often say uh, when I'm teaching a subject is I'm saying, okay, just remember, it's it's fun. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's fun to laugh what some of what people did in the past. Okay, sure, that's all good. But remember, these people are you just in another time and in another context. Because I guarantee it, if you were born at that time, you wouldn't have a 21st century way of thinking. You yeah. wouldn't have that way of thinking. And there's no point raising yourself above them as just these funny little people in the past. Uh, and I think that living history, and this extends to historical European martial arts too, uh, it dispels that theory of, of oh, they were just these stupid people who didn't know anything. Um, and dispels that theory of knights were these clunky, chunky people who didn't know how to fight and just swung around their swords like clubs and all that kind of uh, stuff you see in Hollywood. It, it helps dispel that. And I think living history and the historical martial arts research i think is really important i think for that reason it encourages empathy i think with people in the past and again like what people said we learn from it too the 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 spelling of the um the myths like the hollywood myths yeah that's right is really quite important because some people they they don't think about what they watch on tv they just kind of accept it and go yep whatever that's true um but yeah, your Hollywood myths are just outright stupid. 
yeah in some <laughs> cases like oh a knight falls off his horse he can't get back up because his arm is too heavy mm. and it's like that doesn't make any sense why would someone wear something so heavy that if you fall over you're dead <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. logically it makes no sense yeah that's right and yeah like those those myths from the past are still around today yeah and that's it's right it's pretty damaging as far as just understanding the world hmm. that's right and i think it's yeah it's important to keep the past human not just legends and myths uh mm. it's important to keep it human and living history and historical historical martial arts are important for that i think um all right well we have just two questions and they're very similar to each other uh first one okay have hema and historical japanese martial arts changed over time how and why and what does that mean for the practice today uh okay aiden has hema changed over time well yes very much so <laughs> um hema the hema renaissance only really started like in the 90s mm. uh, that's only really when it started to pick up um we didn't know squat back then and um, we had the manuals mm. barely any of them were translated into english Hmm. Um, barely any of them were even translated into modern German, let alone like they were still in the original. Most of them hadn't even made it onto the internet yet. Right. So the number of people who had access to these resources was very limited. Um, and we pretty much only got a few people's limited view of it. Hmm. Nowadays, lots more manuals have been tra fully translated, uploaded onto the internet. There's a dedicated wiki specifically for historical manuscripts. Um, mm. So anyone now can jump on, see the translated version and make their own interpretations. Now we have a lot more- like talking about, yeah, that sounds- Wicked now, Sorry, yeah. yeah. We've got a lot more tournaments now. Mm. So people with differing opinions can get together, talk about it, test their ideas. Mm. Um, so I think it's become a lot more complete over recent years than it has been in the last like 20 years. That's really interesting because that's very different with Japanese uh, stuff. Uh, Key, in your opinion, Key, uh, has historical Japanese martial arts changed over time? How and why? And what does that mean, do you think? Um, most definitely. Uh, as you know, single Kujidai was the warring era. So every day for them was fighting, fighting, fighting. Um, and then as time went on, peace. And every, all the, the practice that they did wasn't towards combat anymore. It, it, no disrespect to any of the martial artists out there, mm -hmm. but it seems a lot of the stuff in the Edo period was more, I'm bored, let's fill our time with some more martial arts. So you got a lot of techniques that were added that you couldn't really see that could be used. I don't know, I'm not fighting someone on the floor really. Um, which is why I love what he was doing because they're doing a lot more of the combat stuff that we have taken away to kind of just keep the practice going. So um, Japan will never, the Japanese government will never say, no, you can't practice your sword because we want our heritage to continue, but it will never be practiced the way it was originally done. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if any of you went to a, a modern dojo now and thought you could go on the street and fight with it, I don't think that's a reality. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I mean, um, so say in the olden days, there were 10 things that they practiced to, to complete a samurai. Nowadays, we're only practicing five. And there are a lot of extra stuff that's not being done, like the sparring, the gekiken. Mm. And it's kind of for us to step out and do it ourselves to fill those gaps. So, yeah, it definitely has changed a lot. Uh, most people use it for therapeutic reasons now. Mm. It's more not yoga, but you can understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, on, on a weeknight, some guy might be in his office and then afterwards he'll go to relax, make friends, bond, learn something. But it's it will never be looked at to be taken any further than that. As whereas back then it was like, yeah, you're coming to train because tomorrow we're going to war. Mm. So that's kind of been taken away from it. If that makes sense yeah i think it's definitely gotten more institutionalized i think ever yeah. since the air door period first comes in and when schools become much more formal 
um and also the reason for learning how to fight changes as well slowly over time and again i think we mentioned this earlier when the goalposts shift the system has to change with it um because it suits the context um and so on and so on and i think that don't get me wrong i, I don't think that everything they teach nowadays is absolute rubbish i i don't think that at all but i also think that you can't look at the stuff nowadays and see it in the exact same way as it was during the Warring States era, for example, in Japan. And there's just no way. The context is just so radically different. Um, you can't yeah. look at them in the same way. And I think to look at them in the same way produces a lot of misconceptions and misinterpretations, I think. Um, Definitely. What about you, uh, Jem, to do with HEMA or historical Japanese martial arts? What, what do you think? Has it changed over time? Uh okay so when when we're talking about over time are we talking over the past 20 years or are we talking about since it's um so when it first founded when it was first founded as a system basically oh oh crikey um (laughs) yeah no uh it absolutely has changed it's changed drastically Mm. um you know because when these things were founded um written down it's written down by someone who has you know tested it we talked about this before you know uh, a martial arts doesn't get started unless someone's actually used it and survived to tell the tale Hmm. um and as things get um further down the line people tend to get a bit more technical about stuff Mm. um trying to perfectly imitate um what the person who's teaching them is doing um but that can often lead to sort of uh, an almost um uh, pedantic way of doing it to the point where that if someone teaching you makes a mistake about the technique that that will get passed on and Mm. on and on and you end up with something that is completely different to how it started um and i suppose more recently with um you know technology improving and recording and the internet and all that these uh phony martial arts styles that have sort of um spiraled off the edges of these more official ones um have sort of been uh what's the word removed Mm. from practice so there's there's no way that it can be the exact same yeah and to try and keep it the exact same probably isn't practical either the best we can do is i think the spirit of it at least Mm. the the concepts um because unless you have very explicit um someone answering your questions you know the person who wrote it answering your questions you're never going to get it exactly yeah i mean i suppose like it, it, it's definitely important to at least try and discover what it may have been like uh, um but don't think that just because you're trying to discover it means you're doing exactly what it was like yeah i think yeah. would be fair enough to say because that's going to create a lot of misconceptions and misinterpretations um yeah, well, before we go to the last one, uh, we'll go to this. We'll do this next question quickly because I want to. I think uh, Key might have accidentally cut out there. He might have leaned on the Ed uh, leaving meeting button. Uh, hopefully, he'll join back with us soon. But um, I think um, with this one, I just want to go with it quickly. Um, the question is, uh, wait, I think I wrote it down somewhere else, but I think it was, uh, is it possible to be a samurai nowadays? I think was the general <laughs> question. I've got the um, question up here. Is that was that the actual question? Did I get it? The right question right? was a lot longer than that. But, um, oh, sorry, what was it? <laughs> so, so there was two more questions. You said there were. Oh, was it, it two? Is, if oh. a martial arts system has changed over time, is it possible to teach and implement the system the same way it was originally, which is oh, okay. similar to the other? If so, yeah, how? Yeah. And if not, is there a point learning it nowadays? Okay, no, I got that at the end here. Yeah, yeah. I got that at the end. as question thirteen, but I think there was one more that I think I added because I missed it. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I think that was, that was something to do with the modern day samurai. 
Yeah, it was mm. the. Is it um, possible? To is it possible to be a samurai in the modern day? That's the one. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, uh, is it possible to be a samurai in the modern day? Um, in my personal opinion, I think it depends on what do you mean by samurai. Do you mean uh, someone who has a samurai spirit or something, or someone who tries to live the same, I suppose, daily, I suppose, lifestyle? of a samurai or something uh if if you're talking about that then i think yes i think it is possible if you're talking about being an actual samurai um then i would say no and the reason why i say that is because it's a completely different context um i was actually i was in a discussion with a guy once and who claimed he was uh, a samurai uh reincarnated um, so he was an interesting fella um, and he claimed he was from the uh, Otomo clan which is a clan in East Kyushu so the southern island of Japan and I asked him about uh, Buddhism and the clan in a certain year and he was saying oh this and that and this and that and I said well I know you're bullcrapping mate because they were a Christian clan um, and it just goes to show that you can't because like for example what's your retinue uh, how large is your retinue? Um, for example, what, what, how much land do you own? How much koku? How much rice do you have? Like, you can't literally be a samurai. It's, it, it's just, the context is just so different. Um, uh, however, I don't think that means that you cannot live the daily life that a samurai might have lived. I think that's possible, but I don't think that makes you a formal samurai. I think that just makes you a someone who really respects that lifestyle. And wants to try it out i think in my opinion but uh, what about you jim you think i'm wrong or right or do you have something to add or um yeah i mean you can't you literally cannot be an actual samurai because the class was abolished by the emperor of japan in mm. like the 1800s um whether you can embody the spirit i suppose or the belief system mm. of a samurai um i mean i suppose it could be possible but i don't imagine it would actually be terribly beneficial for your everyday life um because mm. it in reality it's a bit outdated by modern <laughs> philosophies um mm. we've had hundreds of years of thought on this sort of stuff and we've moved on quite a bit from the samurai ideals and i guess the mm. bushido or whatever it is yeah i mean don't get um, me wrong i don't think it's we can say that every single value in bushido was outdated no, but, like, no we're there, talking are, there of, are some eternal values. yeah 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 i think it's mainly talking about the rank of a samurai like actually being mm. an actual samurai legal samurai um and i think yeah i think we both said no um did you have anything to say to that, Aiden, or do you think that's... I pretty much agree with what you guys have said. Um, you can embody what it, all the principles, but it doesn't make you a samurai. Rank of samurai was abolished. You, did. Um, <laughs> you, you, can, mm. you can study the martial art. Still doesn't make you a samurai. Yeah. Um, just makes you a student of the art. Yeah, that's right. I, I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, last question, boys. Um, if a martial arts system has changed over time, is it possible to teach and implement the system in the way it was originally? If so, how? And if not, then is there a point in learning it nowadays? Now, I think we've answered the question, is it possible to do it in the exact same way they did it? I think we've kind of said, well, generally no, just because the context is different. Um, it cannot be exactly 100% the same, if, if, although it's okay to try and rediscover it. Um, but because we seem to believe that it's not really possible does that then mean that there is is there still a point to learning it nowadays if, if it's not 100 percent the same i think that's that'd be the question what do you think aiden is there still a point oh i'm gonna go away from my western martial arts and jump over to eastern martial arts and talk about judo okay mm -hmm. judo came directly from a couple of schools of traditional jujitsu mm-hmm it's teaching the exact same techniques in a different way. Mm -hmm. So is it, does it make learning judo pointless? Well, no, mm -hmm. it, it still has 
plenty of application. It's been used in mixed martial arts competitions. It's great for self-defense. It's good for fitness. It's good for your mind. Doesn't, it's not the same thing, same techniques. Doesn't mean it's useless. Um, HEMA, everyone who studies HEMA understands it's not exactly the same, but we can strive to make it the same. Um, but I like to think of it as like, you can always get better and you can always get closer, but you're never gonna quite reach hundred percent. It's like, you can always get closer to perfect, but you'll never get perfect. If you're 99% perfect, you can train longer. You'll be 99.1% perfect but you're never going to reach that 100% like asymptotes towards it. So just because you're not reaching it doesn't mean it's pointless. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Jem? What do you reckon? Is it pointless or is there still a point? It's, it's absolutely incredibly important in my mind, even if you can't get it a hundred percent right. Um, you know, giving it a good old fashioned trial by fire and testing it can certainly point you in the right direction towards getting it more correct, I suppose. Mm. Um, and, you know, preserving history to me is pretty important and it would be just a shame to, to lose such a critical part of life in the past just because mm. we don't think we can achieve it perfectly. Mm. Yeah, we need to try at the very least yeah there's a there's a great quote um of a guy michael alexander he wrote in a book uh, on medievalism about like people using medieval culture to romanticize things um and he said in a comment at the end of the book where he said people who use the argument oh, oh that's not a perfect representation of the past he said that argument removes all form of historical inquiry of its point um, <laughs> he said, you can't, as soon as you use that argument, then all forms of historical, and you think that that's, that's a valid reason, then all forms of historical inquiry become pointless. Uh, if that's what you're going to say, the point is not to be perfect. The point is to learn more about it. Um, and it connects with what I, I feel what you were saying, Aiden, where it's like, it, you, it's not about being exactly the same. It's about learning about what that was and, and learning more and more about it. And I, I like to kind of view it as a, like a puzzle like a, where you have each piece of a puzzle gives you clues as to what it connects to. And this connects to that, this connects to that. And you put it all together and the puzzle gets more and more complete, but never gets finished 100%. Um, and I think that you have a much better idea of the past if you at least do that than if you do nothing and just say, oh, no, it's all pointless. Um, I think that's a big waste, really. And I also think it degrades the point of any kind of historical study, really. Um, every single kind of historical study requires that idea, at least in my opinion, of saying, look, it's not perfect, but I'm still learning more about the past despite that. Um, I think that's important. So no, I think we all agree. It's not pointless. This it still very much has a point. Um, yeah. Nice. All right. Was, was there anything else we wanted to add to that? Or we think that's been pretty straightforward answered. Yeah, no, I think I think we got it. I think pretty that's pretty, pretty much everything. Sweet. Yeah, it's been pretty comprehensive as far as ramblings go. So. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks so much again, uh, you guys. And I'll thanks Key as well when I when I um, chat to him uh, later. Thanks so much, guys, for taking the time to do this and for chatting and everything and balancing up time differences across the world and everything. I really do appreciate that, guys. Uh, I think this has been a really interesting and thank you guys as well out there who are watching this, who've submitted these questions. Uh, you are very uh, philosophical people to say the least. Uh, it's been really interesting, but uh, hopefully this has been interesting for you. And again, we're not experts on all of these matters. These are just our opinions from our own experience and study. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I think it'll be safe to close off the meeting, I reckon.